Uh, welcome to UNSW AI Institute's uh, inaugural distinguished lecture. Uh, we're very honored, uh, extremely happy to have uh, the Angel Jordan University Professor of Computer Science, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and co-director of CMU AI, uh, Professor Thomas Sandholm. Uh, I've, I've been a big fan of uh, Thomas for a very long time. He's uh, uh, one of the all-star professors in our field. He's published uh, over 500 papers uh, in this area. He holds uh, 25 patents. And since 2010, uh, his algorithms have been running the National Kidney Exchange uh, Program uh, in America. In parallel to his academic career, uh, he uh, is a great entrepreneur. He has founded several companies, including Electronic Marketplaces Lab, uh, Optimized Markets, Strategy Robot, and Strategy Machine. Uh, in terms of honors, it's an extremely long list. I'll just uh, highlight a few. Uh, so Thomas is a fellow of the ACM, uh, AAAI, Informs, and uh, AAAS. Uh, he has won several awards, including the Minsky Medal, uh, John McCarthy Award, Computers and Thought Award, uh, ACM Autonomous Agents Research Award, and uh, the Sloan uh, Fellowship. Um, in terms of um, some non-research information, I'll just share one interesting tidbit, which is uh, Thomas uh, has been a world-class windsurfer, so he was number 12 in the world at, at one point. And uh, it's all yours, Thomas. We're very excited to have you as our uh, lecturer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harris. I appreciate uh, the invitation. And um, um, I'll talk about what can and should humans contribute to superhuman AIs. And this is a joint work uh, with a host of different collaborators, my PhD students and postdocs mainly, but also other collaborators. And in each piece of the talk, I'm going to list on the slides who the collaborators for that piece were. So when I talk about superhuman, this advances, yes. When I talk about superhuman AIs, I, I don't mean that my goal in any way is to build like a human replacement that can do a lot of different things, like, like a universal human. Uh, quite the contrary, that's never been my goal and I don't think it should be the goal of our community either. But rather, I talk about specific applications where an AI can do a better job than humans can and make the world a better place. So uh, the, one of the first first things that humans can contribute to superhuman AIs is inventing novel AI applications and scoping AI products. And if you're not used to applying your research, your view of the world might be something like this, that you do some good research and then it somehow gets applied to the world. But at least my experience is that that doesn't really work like that. If you take that approach, the research is going to be a little bit off uh, in its questions and maybe answers from the application so it doesn't really apply to the world. And also, there aren't a host of great people who are uh, scouring the research community and trying to find applications to, uh, to the world. Rather, I see it kind of the other way around, is that the application tells us what the technology gaps are that need to be solved and what are therefore the important research questions to solve. And also, what are the real ethical issues that need to be solved as to invented ethical questions to be discussed? And then uh, there's this important question of how do you scope the product? How do you put the boundaries around your application so that you can make a product? And scalable, I don't mean that just in the sense of computational resources like compute time, memory, whatever. I mean it also in the sense of zero or low variable cost, that is human labor costs for each additional unit. And scoping in AI has all the usual issues of software scoping. And an additional challenge is that modeling tends naturally towards something customized. So you want to scope in a way that modeling can be done automatically and maybe partly by customers without them even thinking that they are actually doing modeling per se. So how do we actually do modeling through user interfaces and so on, instead of having to know some notion of programming or modeling languages and, and, and so on. So in this talk, I'll uh, uh, talk about how developing and fielding superhuman AI applications begat research questions. 
AI techniques and research fields. And uh, I'll give you examples from combinatorial markets, organ exchanges, and imperfect information games. And then I'll conclude with some uh, hopefully controversial conclusions about superhuman AIs and, and my thoughts on that. So let's jump into combinatorial markets. So um, in my first startup company that I founded, CombineNet, we filled large combinatorial multi-attribute sourcing auctions for about 10 years from 2001 to 2010. And this was one of the first software as a service analytics companies. This was remember before the cloud. Uh, so we had to build our own hosting service to host these applications. Um, we fielded over 800 auctions, totaling over 60 billion. And these are still to date the most expressive auctions ever conducted to my knowledge. We created a 12.6% savings for the buy side and the suppliers also benefited. We grew to 130 employees with operations on four continents and the company was acquired in 2010. And now, uh, um, um, I'm actually doing optimization powered combinatorial markets for advertising campaign sales, allocation, scheduling, pricing, and assignment of creatives at optimized markets, another uh, startup that I founded more recently. Uh, but in what I'm going to discuss today, I'll go back to the sourcing application uh, that, that we did. And there were lots of interesting problems that came up. And I'm going to draw several different uh, kind of vignettes through that experience. And I'm going to try to stay with the technical aspects of this so that uh, I'm going to talk about things that are probably mostly of interest to you. Uh, so the first was winner determination. So market clearing uh, or winner determination. The problem is to allocate the business and define it. Uh, so as to minimize cost adjusted for the buyer's quantitative preferences, subject to satisfying all of the constraints. And even a simple subclass of this is NP complete and inapproximable. We solved problems uh, around a hundred times bigger than our competitors on all of the dimensions. And some of our largest auctions included uh, 2.6 million bids 160,000 items, multiple units of each, over 300,000 side constraints, and over 1,000 bidders. The average clearing time, the average clearing time was 20 seconds, the median was one second, and some instances took days to solve. This was also a way of doing automated supply network configuration. In traditional supply chain, you design the network first, and then you source to the network. We actually flipped this around and said that, okay, let's source to all possible network configurations. And then based on the bids, we will actually decide what the network topology in the supply network should be. Now, maybe the most interesting aspect of this that I'll discuss first, is the technology to solve this NP hard in a approximable optimization problem optimally. And the short of it is that the uh, optimization technology that we developed was really a combination of integer programming and AI research of various kinds. The key was to retain the structure from our natural compact expressive bidding languages and expressive bid taker language, as opposed to doing what was popular at the time in academia, which was to convert everything to some sort of a bundle bidding language with various types of XOR constraints between the exclusivity constraints between the bids. And this structure, keeping the structure in the integer program, if you like, uh, really gives a lot of scalability. We had this large scale effort to design fast clearing algorithms, and we actually published many of the papers a lot of interesting things there if you want to read those. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about those. Many of these turn out to be not just for combinatorial auctions, as we initially uh, intended, but actually general for integer programming and uh, even tree search. And now I want to talk about one particular topic therein, which is machine learning for algorithm configuration. 
And we were doing it for the winner determination problem from 2001 to 2010, where in parallel with our production servers, we would have servers on the side, churning on our instances that we had seen so far, training our algorithms to learn to solve these problems faster and faster. And this is the first field application of automated algorithm configuration, which is actually an old idea that goes back to at least uh, the late 70s, if not earlier. Uh, what we did, we were selecting among 12 different configurations uh, for on an instance by instance basis. And these 12 configurations varied based on which of two in mixed integer programming development frameworks was used, CPLEX or ExpressMP, with our techniques on top, of course, because alone CPLEX or ExpressMP would be far from scalable enough for the winner determination problem that we had. And then for each of those frameworks, we had six configurations selected based on what we had seen as making a difference on different instances. For example, cutting plane parameters, different cutting plane parameters, and not only different parameters of the algorithms, but different ways of modeling the problem. So we were not just tuning the algorithm for solving the problem, we were also automatically selecting among different ways of modeling the problem. For example, the modeling of counting constraints in uh, two different ways, which had selective superiority based on the problem instances. And that makes a big difference. The configuration was selected on a per instance basis using about 50 instance features that are quick to compute on our about 80,000 training instances. And the machine learning part here was very simple. We were just using a, uh, a standard package for decision tree induction, but even there we got uh, to within 10% of what we call the speed of light. So if we had actually picked the exact optimal uh, solver configuration of the 12 for each instance separately, we knew how fast we would have solved the 80,000. And with this simple machine learning, we already got very close to that. So uh, to get further improvement, it wouldn't have been really coming from any sort of machine learning improvement. It would have had to come from um, better configurations, maybe more configurations or different configurations and so on. Okay, so uh, that was that. And this is kind of a, maybe a typical story in that we go from practice to theory. So in practice, this worked, but uh, you know, the community, uh, in a, the AI community has been doing algorithm configuration since around 2001, also in academia with uh, not only my work, but Kevin Layton Brown's group's work, Eric Korvitz's group's work, and many other groups. But that has typically been experimental, much like what we were doing in industry. And there's been kind of a lack of theory. And now let me talk about two newer results, kind of from the 2018 timeframe on um, about theory of algorithm configuration. Can you somehow prove something good or something bad about this approach? And first I'm gonna start with the bad. So the bad news. Even when finding a convex combination of just two standard branching rules, bad things happen. And for those of you who don't know integer programming, let me uh, explain a bit about strong branching so you can understand this. Strong branching in integer programming is just one step look ahead. You choose a question to branch on, usually a variable, and then you uh, assume that the variable is rounded down on the one side, and on the other side of the branch, you assume that the variable is rounded up. You solve the linear program at each of those two children, and each of them moves the bound. We'll say that the, uh, the, ch the better child is the one that moves the bound more, and the worst child is the one that moves the bound less. Uh, so now, by and large, you would like to branch on a variable that moves the bounds a lot, but you have to somehow trade off how do you measure the bound improvement uh, across the better and worse, worse child, because you need one number at the end of the day to compare the different variables to branch them. So how do you aggregate these two bound changes, the better one and the worst one, 
into an overall number of bound change. And this gives you a space of convex combinations. Uh, let's say that here on the x-axis, we have a mu, which says that how much do you weight the better child versus the wor uh, worst child? So one is weighted by mu, the other one is weighted by min one minus mu. Now, um, here's the theorem. For any discretization of mu, uniform or not, there is an infinite family of problem instance distributions of the optimization problem where this issue happens. Where this issue that is that there is some range of mu in between your discretization points where you get a small constant size tree, but at every one of your discretization points, you get an exponential tree. And this is true not only kind of as an instance, but also as an average over a total instance distribution. So this is that the traditional approach of approaching this problem, which is to try to di try different parameter values, isn't really guaranteed to work. You can get very unlucky in that you miss the, uh, miss the good values of the parameter. And this is now true even for a single parameter, not to talk about uh, multiple parameters that are being tuned as we usually do. Okay, so that was the bad news. And now I'm gonna move to um, some good news. And I'm gonna tell you about algorithm configuration with generalization guarantees. And I'm gonna show you a general theorem on this slide that applies to any algorithm configuration problem and any performance function. And in particular, I would like you to think about three classes of problems that are different from each other, but the same theorem applies to each one. The first one is like what we talked about so far. You have an optimal solver, so the solution quality is going to be perfect, and you're just trying to tune the solver to make it run faster. The second is one where uh, the algorithm itself might, is not optimal, and I'm trying to tune the parameters of the algorithm so it finds better solutions. And I'm gonna give you examples of each one of these classes on the next slide after the theorem. And the third is that I'm trying to learn a surrogate objective for an existing algorithm so that the algorithm does well on the real problem at hand, which I don't really know, except through samples. And I'll give you an example from biology on that. So now um, pick any one of your favorite problems here. I think the easiest to think about is the first one, where we're looking at an integer program, complete tree search, finds an optimal solution, and we're just trying to uh, minimize runtime. So now I want you to fix in your head a problem instance. So you have this whole distribution of problem instances, but think about one of them for a second. Now you are uh, going to get a picture like this typically, where let's say that the algorithm has three parameters, then the performance function is split by hyperplanes into regions such that in every region, the algorithm is going to take the same steps. In other words, the algorithm is gonna have the exact same runtime within the region. But then as you go across the hyperplane, the runtime changes because the algorithm is going to do something different. So I want you to hang your hat on this, but I'm gonna actually show you a more general theorem than this. I'm going to allow a performance function that might have nonlinear boundary functions instead of hyperplanes and not to be a constant within each region. For example, it might, might be a quadratic curve in the region and the boundary functions might be cubic curves, what have you. Now, here's the theorem. Assume the range of the performance function is normalized to zero one, which is without loss of generality. Then with probability one minus delta over the draw of this many training instances, and I'm gonna walk you through what those quantities mean. For any algorithm parameters, 
the expected performance over the unknown instance distribution is within epsilon of the algorithm's performance on the training set. So in other words, this theorem is saying in a pack learning sense that uh, if you see this many training instances, you can in a pack learning sense guarantee that the performance on the training set is close to that on the real distribution, which you don't know. In particular, it's if your algorithm does well on the training set, it is going to do well on previously unseen instances. And what are these quantities here now? Well, uh, C G star is the VC dimension of the dual class of the boundary function class. So it measures the complexity of the boundary functions. And C F star is a pseudo dimension of the dual class of the within region function class. Remember that in the example above, it was constant, but it doesn't have to be constant. And K here is the maximum number of boundary functions needed for any one instance. That's why I wanted you to think about one instance in the picture above. So in that case, it would be asking how many hyperplanes are needed for that instance to correctly capture their uh, performance function. All right. Now um, we have used this to in a host of different settings. And one is to study branching heuristics and cutting planes in integer programming. That's an example of the first kind of problem where we're trying to make things run faster. Uh, second, we have used this for linkage-based clustering. This is clustering where you start from all of the items being separate, and then you start merging them together using some heuristic. And what the heuristic is affects the solution quality of the final cluster. And third is various sequencing problems uh, in, in biology. And uh, there, the sequencing problems are such where you don't know really the actual objective. You have some, let's say, dynamic program typically a dynamic program, and you have some sort of surrogate objective. And you're trying to align the surrogate objective with reality, but reality is only accessible by expensive uh, uh, biological wet lab experiments. So you want to minimize those experiments while uh, constructing a good surrogate function. Um, also, we developed an algorithm for data-dependent discretization of continuous parameters. And that can be uh, used for portfolio construction, algorithm portfolio construction, or as input to any algorithm configuration tool that assumes a finite set of candidate parameter vectors. For example, those by Kleinberg et al. or Weiss et al. And also, uh, what you can do if you don't need to have an exact model of the performance function, like let's say you allow epsilon error in that, then you can get away with way fewer pieces in your model, and therefore way fewer of those uh, boundary functions, and therefore with way fewer samples. So in practice, we see about a 700 factor improvement in the sample complexity by allowing even just a relatively small amount of approximation. OK. Uh, and we developed the first generalization guarantees for portfolio-based algorithm selection. So if you were really paying attention, you saw that in the industrial uh, world, we did portfolio-based, where we have a portfolio of 12 algorithms. And on an instance-by-instance instance basis, we selected hopefully the best one. Uh, here in the theory so far, we wanted one universally good algorithm parameterization that does as well as possible across the whole instance distribution. But now we also have generalization guarantees for portfolio-based algorithm selection. So we can do the whole thing with generalization guarantees. And that has the two parts. One is you need generalization guarantees in constructing the portfolio. So you have the right algorithms in the portfolio. And then you need uh, generalization guarantees for the selector that is going to select on an instance basis from the portfolio. 
All right, let me move to the next topic here. Uh, also motivated by the wor uh, work in combinatorial auctions that we were doing in industry, uh, we introduced the idea of preference elicitation for multiple agents. And of course, preference elicitation from single agents at the time is uh, a thing that goes way back, probably 100 years. But this is really taking into account the specific structure of multi-agent systems. And this has become an active field since. And the key observation is here, uh, let's say we have the clearing algorithm, the winner determination algorithm, and we have the bidders thinking about their bids. The idea is that we can tack onto the clearing algorithm an elicitor that elicits information from the bidders instead of the bidders just pushing their bids. And the key observation is that what information is needed from an agent depends on what others have revealed so far. So for example, let's say this bidder bids $1,000 for the bike and the TV. This bidder bids $1,500 for the bike. Then we already know that we don't not need to know the first bidder's value for the bike because we know it's less than 1,000. And we already know that we can get at least $1,500 for the bike. So we don't need to know the first bidder's valuation for the bike. But the bidder doesn't know it yet. So this is kind of an uh, uh, example where the auctioneer can make some inferences that some information from the bidders is not needed, and that can save the bidders valuation computation effort, their deliberation effort. So the elicitor designs that we came up with decide what to ask bidders next based on answers it has received so far. And for some classes of valuation functions, eliciting the number, eliciting the actual function requires an exponential number of queries. So if, so if you want to fully elicit the preferences of an agent, you need to uh, make an exponential number of queries. But the polynomial number of queries suffices for allocating the items optimally among the bidders. So most of the preference information from the agents is actually unnecessary. So we studied elicitation with many different query types and established the connection to query learning and uncovered valuation classes that can be elicited with a polynomial number of queries. We might also worry about incentives, that wouldn't this elicitor somehow leak information across bidders? And yes, it does. So for example, a bidder can infer that if the elicitor asks the bidder something, the other bidders have not revealed information that would have made that query irrelevant. So despite that, answering truthfully can be made an ex post equilibrium by using externality pricing. For example, the vickrey clark crofts mechanism or generalizations like the affine maximizer auctions. This leads to a push-pull mechanism where the bidders can push bids if they think that they're competitive and the elicitor can pull information that the elicitor knows is relevant or at least knows is not irrelevant yet. And whether you're getting pushed or pulled doesn't really matter as long as in the end you get an optimal allocation and can compute the externality pricing. It's still every bidder's exposed best strategy to, tell, uh, to answer every query truthfully and to do all of the pushes that they do truthfully. Now, a third thing that happened uh, uh, is that we started thinking about automated mechanism design uh, in the context, first in the context of combinatorial auctions. And uh, there, the idea was that the sourcing company that's buying things from the suppliers knows a lot of information about the supply base. So why is it that our auction designs as a first step start by ignoring all of that information. It doesn't make any sense. And then we started thinking about how can we actually use that information to design better mechanisms? And can we then automatically design better mechanisms with that data? And the idea in automated mechanism design is to solve mechanism design as a search or optimization problem automatically, as opposed to manually as a paper and pen characterization exercise. And this creates mechanisms for the specific setting at hand rather than for a class of settings. 
and therefore it can lead to greater value of the designer's objective than known mechanisms. It can circumvent economic impossibility results and it can yield stronger incentive compatibility and participation properties. And it can be used in new settings and for unusual objectives. So we applied this to many academic domains ranging from uh, social choice, combinatorial social choice, divorce settlements, uh, um, and a host of other applications, and in two high-value sourcing auctions. Now, when we first started this, we started this kind of as a tabula rasa exercise, where we start from a clean slate and we use a linear program or an integer program to fill in a table of what should the allocation and rule, what should the allocation be and what should the payments be if payments are allowed uh, for any possible combination of type value uh, revelations that the agents might make. And that's not very scalable. It scales to maybe two or three items and two or three bidders, and that's about it. So here are two key ideas that increase the scalability and avoid the need to discretize the type space. First, we don't assume that the distribution over bidders valuations is given, but rather just samples from it. And this has since become an active research field in theoretical computer science and AI. And the other is automated mechanism design, not in a clean slate way, in a table, but a search in a parametric mechanism class, where every mechanism in the class has some desirable properties. For example, truth telling as the best uh, strategy and participation as the best strategy. And now there's an interesting connection back to the theorem that I gave you for algorithm configuration. The same theorem can be applied to uh, mechanism configuration as well. And we applied this to designing revenue maximizing auctions, revenue maximizing pricing mechanisms, and revenue maximizing uh, lotteries. We have also applied this to voting and redistribution mechanisms. And we also designed a way to determine the best mechanism in a hierarchy of mechanisms. So the trade-off here is that is, as you have a more complex mechanism with more parameters, if you like, you can fit your training data better. And it looks on the training data like your mechanism is better, but you're going to overfit and your performance on the real distribution, uh, uh, which you don't know, is actually getting worse. So there's this trade-off between the complexity of the mechanism, too much complexity or flexibility leads to overfitting and too little causes you not to do well even on the training data. So based on the number of samples and the specific kinds of mechanism classes, we now this have this theory as to when you have a hierarchy of mechanisms, given that you know how many samples you're going to get, where in the hierarchy you should pick. Uh, pick your mechanism to strike that as balance optimally. Now, moving to a different topic, but stemming from automated mechanism design. This is more of a philo philosophical slide, exponentially long theories and the future of science. So uh, this started from a result that we had on automated mechanism design, which is that designing the highest expected revenue deterministic multi-item auction is NP complete. And that means that there is not going to be any polynomialized characterization of that mechanism. Like for example, there is for a single item revenue maximizing auction by Meyerson. And people have been trying to search for such for 40 years. And I guess I'm telling bad news here is that you can stop the search. There's not going to be one. Uh, the caveat is that you could still have a characterization theorems that are short if they could actually make calls to NP complete oracles. But putting that aside, there is not going to be any short characterization. So the theorem that characterizes would have to be exponentially long. And note, I'm not talking about the complexity of the proof here, I'm talking about the complexity of the theorem statement. And maybe controversially, I'm actually thinking that maybe this is a more relevant use of NP hardness for the future. In AI, we solve NP hard problems all the time to optimality. So NP hardness 
to us isn't really saying that the problem can't be solved. But this is definitely something that NP hardness means uh, in terms of lengths of theorems. And if the theorems have to be exponentially long, they're going to be too long for a human to generate or for a human to understand. And NP complete problems arise in other sciences too, for example, in physics. So even empirical theories may have to be exponentially long to be correct. This seems to fly in the face of Occam's razor from the philosophy of science, but it's not a contradiction. Occam's razor is actually not provable. It's impossible to prove that short hypotheses have better generalization accuracy. So what is the future of science? Current scientific methods, both theoretical and empirical, are geared towards only finding truths that are short. Should we fix this, given that we now know that we need to have a long theory sometimes? And if so, how do we fix this? And does knowledge have to be human understandable? Certainly, knowledge that's not human understandable can still be useful. But if that's what science is going to be, how should non-human understandable knowledge be stored and indexed for use? All right, let me move to the second part of the talk, organ exchanges. And I'm gonna start by kidney exchanges. And here at the simplest, the idea is, is as follows. You don't have enough deceased donor organs going around. And if I wanted to give a kidney to Harris who might be needing a kidney, I probably wouldn't be able to due to let's say tissue type and blood type incompatibility or a few other factors. So that's where kidney exchange comes in. And at the simplest, it's like this. You have a willing but incompatible pair. Think about Harris and me. There's a donor who's willing to give to a patient, but they're incompatible. And there's another pair where the donor is willing to give to the patient, but they are incompatible. So we could actually swap the donors. Donor one gives to patient two, donor two gives to patient one, and that way both of the patients can live. Now I want you to think about these pairs as vertices in a graph. And then we're going to have this kind of in input graph. We are going to have the pairs as the vertices and the edges represent compatibility. And also there can be different weights on these edges to represent different desirability of transplants, different levels of compatibility. Maybe you prefer pediatric patients. Maybe you prefer patients who have waited a long time, et cetera, et cetera. The objective of the batch optimization problem is to find the maximum weight combination of short disjoint cycles. So it is not hard to determine who's compatible with whom and finding compatible matches. The hard part is finding the best combination of short disjoint cycles. And they have to be short, typically two cycles and three cycles for logistical reasons and certain robustness reasons. Then we had this uh, idea with uh, Mike Reese and other collaborators, like what if there were a person in the country who's willing to give a kidney for nothing, doesn't expect a kidney exchange in exchange for a loved one? What would that do to the pool? And that would trigger a chain in the pool instead of a cycle, because you don't have to close the loop back. And at the end of the chain, there is the leftover organ from the last pair's donor. And we can actually pretend that that is another altruist donor in the next week's optimization batch. So that's where we get these never ending altruistic donor chains, in other words, need chains. And here's actually the first need chain, which was generated by our, our algorithm. And since then, very quickly, this has been adopted worldwide. So need chains have become the main modality of kidney exchange worldwide now, and way more transplants are being done by need chains than by cycles. In fact, um, over 10,000 patients have received transplants using these need chains. Here's a picture the, uh, from 2012 of a um, 30 need chain that was at that point 30 long. You see 60 people here because it's uh, every pair has a donor and a patient. Now, uh, 
let's talk about algorithms for solving this problem or the winner determination problem or market clearing problem now in kidney exchange. And it's quite different than it is in a combinatorial auction. Here, uh, even solving the batch problem, well, again, it's NP complete, even without chains, as long as three cycles are allowed. Chains in practice make it even harder. And uh, without going into the whole history of this, the first algorithm that was scalable was based on branch and price with a lot of domain specific goodies on top. We de designed it in 2007. And uh, that actually enabled the nationwide kidney exchange. And then there has been a host of work by us and by many other groups around the world on coming up with better and better algorithms. And I'm going to just thump, jump to the latest and greatest here, which is uh, uh, like this. For cycles, it works just as before. You basically enumerate the cycles and use them as uh, variables in, in, in uh, column generation. But for chains, there are just too many. Then you get too many because uh, the chains can be much longer. There's no logistical constraint that they have to be short. And you don't have to close the loop, which uh, also cuts back on the number of cycles because only so, uh, so many chains actually close into a cycle. Here, you don't have that. So you have tons of different chains. So what do you do with the chains? Well, instead of trying to generate them, like in column generation, we actually change the model here. So instead of having a variable xij, xij that says that, OK, the edge from vertex i to j is used or not used, we have lifted these variables into xijk, where we say that, OK, is the edge from i to j the kth edge in a chain? And you might say, well, that's, that's really redundant. Why are you doing it? And in, in, indeed, it is redundant. And of course, we have to have the constraints that if an edge is used at position k plus 1 in the chain, there must be an appropriate edge used at position k in that chain. Otherwise, there would not, not even be an option to use the k plus first position. But that's redundant. But turns out that these redundant lifted constraints actually cause the linear programming relaxation to be so much tighter that you, that you get much shorter search paths in the integer programming and very quick solving of the problem. All right, so um, our technology is actually used by UNOS. Uh, it was selected in an open competition in 2008. We licensed it to UNOS for free and the national exchange went live in 2010. And it now has grown to 80% of the transplant centers in the US and we do a match run every week. And before UNOS, we already uh, ran match runs for two private kidney exchanges, the Alliance for Pair Donation and the Pair Donation Network. The latter has been closed since the UNOS exchange started. The former still does um, their own match runs as well, although the pool was also integrated into the UNOS pool. And now moving to what I think is the main, most important slide of the talk. So if you want to wake up for one slide, this is the one. Uh, here, I'm going to talk about future match, which is about combining human value judgments, machine learning, and integer program for large scale dynamic problems. And um, uh, here, we are separating the ends versus means. So let the humans talk about the ends, the value system, and let AI really sort through the means, sort through the policy search, and sort through the combinatorics. Oftentimes, in my experience, people confound the two. And they are trying to take their experiences from how they have been solving problems, the means, and trying to uh, mock that into the ends. But here we have a clean separation. And I think this is very important in designing AI systems. Secondly, we're going to uh, uh, use a myopic optimization for scalability. But we are going to make it smart about the future so it can work much like full stochastic optimization without the complexity that comes with it, which would be completely prohibitive here. And what we have is sort of like policy gradient, except that there is no gradient. And the problem is so large and discrete that an integer program needs to be solved even to execute one step of the policy. And then we're going to introduce fairness into it as well. OK, so let's get started here. First. Um, 
the experts, the humans are going to give the objective to the system. And uh, for example, in kidney exchanges might be maximum graft survival in the system or maximum cardinality that's making the most transplants or maximum beta weighted cardinality where we favor some disadvantaged groups. So we might favor children or we might we favor highly sensitized patients and so on. Then we take historical data to come up with the weights into the system. And to give you one example, there was this big debate uh, on the policy committee that I'm on, where people were say, uh, arguing how many extra points should you get for a perfect six-way HLA match, tissue type match. And um, uh, instead of arguing from you got, we actually took the data and looked at how much does graft survival actually improve with a perfect HLA match versus imperfect. And we used techniques like this and uh, just machine learning to parameterize the weights using that historical data. Then we use historical data of the kidney exchange to calibrate a graph generator that can generate new instances of kidney exchange problems. And then we're going to learn what we call potentials. And potentials are saying that, okay, for different graph elements, for example, at the simplest just vertices, how much would the vertex contribute in the future if we didn't use it up now? And experts tell us what type of features would go into that, what features might matter. So for example, the donor's blood type might matter, the patient's blood type in a vertex might matter, and so on. Then we are going to uh, learn the potentials by running the simulator and running the system. And then we're going to turn the knobs. The knobs are the potentials, and we're going to turn them and see how the system performs and automatically make it perform better and better. In this case, we used a tool called SMAC, which is an algorithm configuration tool to turn the knobs, but there are other alternatives as well. And once we have learned the potentials, then in the actual match, which happens online once the new real kidney exchange problem of the week comes in, we can run the integer program with a revised objective that includes the potentials. So we uh, maximize the traditional objective, but we subtract out the potentials of the elements that are used up. So it takes into account that that's actually something that makes the future worse if we use them now. And that puts in the optimal amount of liquidity and the right kind of liquidity into the pool. Instead of just draining the pool uh, uh, with the best week after week, uh, which causes the liquidity to drop over time. With this, for example, uh, uh, for a particular beta weighting of highly sensitive patients, this improves over the traditional myopic week-to-week -week matching in both the number of transplants and the number of sensitized transplants. So we are actually getting a win-win here on both objectives. Um, liver lobe and cross organ exchanges, these ideas don't just apply to kidneys. I've also invented liver lobe and cross organ exchanges and uh, with my student John Dickerson, we actually did some ex experiments um, in simulation and also some theory that shows that this produces a large benefit compared to running separate uh, liver and kidney exchanges. And that was just a concept paper with some experiments and theory but serendipitously, uh, this uh, young lady here in the picture had actually read the paper and uh, their loved one needed a uh, liver lobe and she thought it was real. And they were talked to her transplant surgeon that could, could they do it? And the transplant surgeon actually said, well, no, uh, that type of exchange doesn't actually exist. This is just, that was just a concept paper, but I'll do it. And this was the world's first uh, liver lobe against uh, kidney swap, and this took place in 2019. Now, um, uh, let me just uh, move to the last topic, imperfect information gains. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, multiplayer games. Recently, we developed uh, an AI for multiplayer poker that is superhuman. And the main idea 
main ingredient that really enabled this is depth limited sub game solving. This is something that's standard in perfect information games, but in imperfect information games, this is very tricky because a player's optimal strategy below a certain information set depends on the other player's strategy above the information set and vice versa. So you cannot really, the nodes don't have values. So you can't really have an evaluation function. Rather, what we do, we allow uh, at, at the depth limit, we allow all of the players to select from a relatively small number of continuation strategies uh, strategically while they select their strategies um, for the earlier part of the game. And also these continuation strategies can be automatically generated with provable guarantees of finding equilibrium. All right, um, modules for solving games. Well, people talk about game solving algorithms, but nowadays I think about uh, game solving pipelines as having multiple different modules, different algorithms within each module. And then depending on the application, you glue those different modules together in various ways. So one is the abstraction module where you run a state abstraction or action abstraction algorithm in advance. And uh, there's a lot of good work there. By the way, on this slide, I'm only citing papers that we have done uh, so that you get references if you wanna look, but uh, a lot of other people have done work in this space as well. And you can find that work by going to those papers, lists of references. Currently, the best state abstraction and action abstraction algorithms in practice are not the same ones that are theoretically sound. So there's still a lot to do there. Uh, Real-time subgame solving. Uh, I mentioned that this was key to the multiplayer uh, milestone with the depth limited search. And even for the two-player case, really real-time subgame solving in Libratus was the key ingredient, but that wasn't depth limited, but that was still looking all the way to the end of the game. And now with Pluripush, we were doing depth limited search. And that allowed us to tackle this harder problem, a multiplayer game on a single regular server, as opposed to running for a year on a supercomputer like we had done for Libratus. We have also developed techniques that just use level K knowledge instead of, uh, um, common knowledge. And that's very important in games like dark chess, where the common knowledge closures are of size 10 to the 14, unlike in poker, where they're of size 10 to the six. Um, and with that, we have developed the first competent player for dark chess, um, co competent AI for dark chess. And it's not superhuman yet, but there are probably about 10 people in the world only that can currently beat it. Equilibrium finding algorithms. Um, the leading regret minimization algorithms, leading offline first order optimization methods. And it's kind of amazing that the regret minimization algorithms are actually always a little bit better, although they actually don't use all the information that's available. So in the offline first order optimization methods, you can actually optimize both players at the same time. In the regret minimization framework, you think about them separately and they are thinking about their own problems only, yet they're faster in practice. Uh, Pruning of the game tree, you can't prune like you can in perfect information games. You can only do temporary pruning in various ways. Uh, sound warm starting was thought to be impossible, but it's actually possible if you do it carefully. Automated sparsification of LP for equilibrium finding, very recent idea that has actually made LP competent, competitive again with these uh, other techniques. Um, algorithms for equilibrium refinements, for example, trembling hand refinements, even just four years ago, they could only solve games with about a thousand nodes. Today, we can solve games with um, hundreds of millions of nodes. So not quite as scalable as Nash equilibrium, but we can do these equilibrium refinements now. Um, let me just skip the rest of this, but hopefully this is gonna show up on the video. If you're interested in any of these topics later, you can read the papers. So a lot of exciting, very new work going on in game solving, lots of open problems, very exciting. And um, let me just say one more thing on this. In this company, Strategy Robot and Strategic Machine, where we are actually applying game solving, uh, we get a lot of practical questions about modeling and access. 
to the game. So what if the game model is inaccurate? And one answer to that is that the lossy game abstraction techniques that for which we have exploitability guarantees actually apply to modeling also. They, we de designed them to bound the gap between the game model and abstraction, but they can also be used to bound the gap between the real world and the game model, and even the gap between the real world and the game abstraction. So um, uh, if you can measure somehow how far your model is from reality or bound how far your model is from reality, you can actually go back and say that your strategies derived in the model are no more exploitability exploitable than epsilon in the actual real world. The second question I often get is, what if there's only simulator access? Nobody tells you the rules of the game. You just get an Xbox game for Christmas. You have a month to play it, and you can play all, all sides of it if you like. But in a month, you have to play, be able to beat everybody in the world. Well, if you do, let's say, deep reinforcement learning, you don't get any guarantees of non-exploitability. And that was really the state of the art until about two years ago. And now we developed the first techniques for computing probably equilibrium strategies or near equilibrium strategies while searching only a tiny fraction of the game tree. So we actually generate a certificate of optimality or near optimality while only generating a tiny fraction of the game tree. And the algorithm has convergence rate O tilde number of nodes in the expanded part of the game tree, not the whole game tree, divided by the square root of the number of playthroughs. And in the two player zero sum game, it converges to minimax. And in more general games, it converges to coarse correlated equilibrium. And prior methods, for example, MCCFR, can be exponential in the size of the entire game. OK, let me conclude. OK, so uh, one issue that I found is that humans have overconfidence, not just in themselves, but in other humans over AI. And I've seen this in all three of these applications. This is really a bottleneck to developing superhuman AIs, because as the AI's performance approaches that of the best humans, the human's advice becomes less and less relevant. And right at the boundary where we are about as good as humans in AI in a given application, that's where half of the human's recommendations or evaluations are wrong. And for example, in poker in the early days, the humans saw a lot of mistakes in our AIs and their ideas, the corrections were right. They would say, okay, that's a mistake and a mistake it was. And then we got to the point where they were doubting some moves. We were making some really unintuitive moves. And in particular, one move I remember that all of the players at the time were saying that's a mistake. And then I had Chris Ferguson, who's one of the most mathematical poker players in the world, PhD in computer science, actually studied that situation for three days. And he figured out that that was exactly the right move. But it, it, it is very complicated. And as we get to that boundary, because the human's uh, advice becomes worse and worse, it's like trying to go through the sound barrier. Things just get more and more difficult because you cannot get good advice anymore. Also, humans tend to micromanage AI for the worse. This is, uh, has been seen, for example, in the, in the Army Research Laboratory, where they have done ground robots working together with soldiers. The soldiers micromanage the robots so much that they perform worse than they would have been would have without any human involvement. That brings the question of human oversight over AI, which I hear a lot, but I'd like to flip it around. You know, at least in my life, where I interact both with humans and AIs, I'm, I'm uh, suffering many more mistakes by humans than by AIs. So maybe there should also be AI oversight over humans. And this overconfidence of humans over AI is a bottleneck to fielding AI. And oftentimes I see that humans are reluctant to field the AI even when the AI is actually better, just because the human is not the AI is not doing the same thing as the humans would. So that's why uh, I always advocate that we should set up objective criteria in advance before you see the results, and then based on that we decide whether it's a good idea to field or not, or ready to field or not. Another topic uh, 
that I have strong feelings about is explainability. And here I won't focus on supervised learning because there's been so much discussion. We're going to talk more about problems like planning and optimization, explainability of that. And in many applications, we should not insist that AI be human understandable or explainable. And that is because that requirement can reduce solution quality dramatically. To give you an example, the true explanation can be beyond humans. For example, a huge tree certificate of optimality in integer programming or tree search. And if we require that the proof of optimality be somehow human understandable, we can't use these sophisticated techniques. Maybe we need to just resort to some greedy algorithm and tell the human that yes, we executed things according to the greedy algorithm, but, uh, and they can verify every step, but that, that doesn't guarantee optimality. And it, in fact, compromises solution quality significantly. And what does explainability even mean? Is it about the AI's reasoning process, explaining the reasoning process? Or is it about optimality of the conclusion? Or is it about something else? And we don't really truly require that human reasoning be explainable either. So humans have different mental models. They don't know each other's mental models. If you really get down to it, we can't see our own reasoning either in our, inside our heads. So we are communicating under these very uh, fuzzy mental models, which are different from each other. So they're not real explanations either. So to conclude, what can and should humans contribute to superhuman AIs? Well, humans can invent novel AI applications, scope and develop the AIs and provide the value system for the AI. But be careful what you ask for. So for example, in early work that I did in the in 1989, 1990, 1991 timeframe on tracking uh, optimization systems for the forestry industry in Finland, uh, we heard a lot of people saying that you should maximize utilization. But if you maximize utilization, you are actually filling all of the trucks and driving around without ever dropping off anything. That's 100% utilization. So you've got to be careful what you ask for. And we've seen this in a lot of applications, including portfolio planning for the US military, where the traditional heuristics that are used as kind of for manual planning, you don't want to use them as a real objective in any sort of uh, optimization or game theoretic reasoning, because that leads you astray. The utility function specification can be an AI supported iterative process. Like when we do portfolio planning, we often do it like that, where we start with the traditional op objectives that they have used, and then you get paradoxical results. And then you go back and say, yes, but this is optimal answer to the problem you specified. Let's re-specify the objective. And in a few iterations, you get to reasonable objectives and therefore reasonable conclusions. Reference elicitation from multiple experts remains a challenge, especially when lives are at stake. Like I designed a questionnaire about preferences that uh, I was hoping that UNOS would send out to the transplant centers. Uh, this is a few years ago, but uh, they didn't want to even send it out when they saw it, because it's so controversial to put people in front of like life and death decisions that uh, it makes people uncomfortable and they don't want to answer those types of questions. And this is especially true if they're experts. It seems that laymen are much more willing to give that type of judgments than real experts who work in the domain. And don't double in the means. Let AI do the sifting through policies and through combinatorics, and just uh, humans should stay away from that and not mix means and ends. Humans can provide candidate solution pieces, and I'm leaving that abstract on purpose because solution pieces, they could include little behaviors in uh, game theoretic planning, for example, they can include candidate solution pieces in um, uh, integer programming, kind of blueprints, they can mean a lot of things. Uh, and that can make AI solving better. So how do you glue to how does the AI glue together those pieces instead of working at lower levels of abstraction? And humans can give evaluations of AI's actions, which can be helpful, but you must be careful when approaching the superhuman boundary, because both the advice and the evaluations are going to be half wrong 
at the boundary. And beyond that, they're going to be more than half wrong. And don't micromanage the AI. Overall, we should work in the trenches of the application. I hope that this uh, story that I presented today showed how entire new research fields came about, not because we were somehow smarter than the next guy, but because we were in the trenches of the application and the application showed us new problems that academics hadn't been addressing before. And work on real, not imagined technology caps and ethical issues. And I would like to flip the notion of ethics around. So typically, systems are designed and built first, and then the ethicists come uh, behind and criticize various aspects. And I've been in that poll, I've written papers with ethicists and so on. I want to flip it around to what I would call pre design ethics, where the ethics have to be specified up front, up front, almost like an optimization framework, and then we optimize our system designs to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas, for a very insightful and uh, broad uh, lecture. So uh, we have a few questions. Uh, I'll just go through some of them. Uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, they can um, unmute or they can raise their hand and I can, we can unmute you. So the first question is that, are there any concerns about the approach of application first, ethics second? Given it is hard to go back on harmful tech once it's made, uh, or in practice, is the approach more iterative? Okay, I'm seeing it. Are there any concerns about the approach of application first, ethics second? Now, I, I think that this question was typed in 45 minutes ago. I hope this last slide that I just uh, in, uh, introduced is saying exactly the opposite. I want to have the ethics first. I want the ethics to be uh, specified first. And I want to design the system to the ethics. So uh, on the same issue, you, you mentioned that uh, we shouldn't dabble with the means. But uh, is it really that easy to have a clean separation between uh, the means and end for, for every application? Or is it specific to future match and certain other applications? Well, future match, I think, of as a framework, not an application. Uh, and the kidney exchange is the application but it can be used for a host of different applications. Um, uh, I think we should strive to separate means and ends. And I haven't really seen an application where they can't be separated. Now, I can't say that there isn't such a thing. They might be, but I, I haven't seen it. And in each application that I have been working in, I've seen people tend to confound those. So people tend to think about, oh, in that situation, I would do that. And in this other situation, I would do this. And this is how you do it. And then oh, with the old owners, you always have to do this. And things like that. Uh, rules of thumb, because that's how humans approach problems. And it's hard for people who don't think about AI and optimization and game theory to separate themselves out from that and just go abstract and say, OK, here's your ethical framework. And these are, this is objective. And now let the AI do its thing. It's such a foreign thing to somebody who's never done it. That, that, that's why people tend to confound it. But I think we should fight that temptation. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple of other questions. So Toby has a question regarding, uh, is there any work on automating the design of new abstractions for new games? OK, that's a. Uh, Design of so maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but there there are there's a host there is a whole literature on all abstraction algorithms, and the abstraction algorithms take the game as input and output the abstraction. So it's all about automating the design of new abstractions. Um, if I'm taking this literally. Maybe, Toby, are you asking whether there's somehow sort of a way of automatically designing abstraction algorithms? Or maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. I'm, I'm not sure if Toby's, uh, might have to raise his hand uh, for, for me to unmute him. Uh, but meanwhile, let's just move to uh, the last question. Uh, in kidney exchange, 
uh, you mentioned that experts are used to figure out vertex potentials. Uh, could this also be automated and based on historical data? Yes, so I think this is a misunderstanding. So we are doing the vertex potential learning automatically using SMAC. Uh, so uh, that's automatic. But the experts are giving input as to what features of the pairs might matter for the vertex potentials. And then those features, the vertex potentials are conditioned on those features. So, uh, uh, and, and you can put in a superset and if they don't matter, the system will figure out that they don't matter. But of course, it's, if you put too many things in there, it's gonna make it computationally much harder. So, uh, so that's why when we did our experiments, we were actually using just uh, blood type of the donor and blood type of the recipient in the pair. And because there are four, four blood types that already gives a four by four, which is 16 that way, 16 different kinds of pairs. So we were learning 16 numbers, potentials for 16 different kinds of pairs using SMAC. So think about you running this super, on a supercomputer, you're running this kidney exchange simulator and you're running it over and over for a given parameter vector of those 16 parameters, just so you would get statistical significance, hopefully, given all the noisiness of the problem. And then you change those parameters using SMAC or some other technique, and then you run the thing over and over and see, did you actually make it worse or better? And, and, and so on. So that's, uh, we are using a 16 dimensional parameter vector, but uh, clearly you could do more or you could do less. With more, you have a bigger policy space. So you have a whole hope of coming up with better policies, but the complexity and uh, of how many simulations you need to run, uh, of course, is much higher than. All right, so uh, we'll take two questions. Actually, uh, two questions. So have you had any experience de-emphasizing explainability when dealing with clinicians and clinical applications? Yes, yes. So uh, this was a big thing in kidney exchange in the early days. And, and this is a battle that we had and we won. You don't always win your battles, but this is fortunately one that was won. And uh, yeah, they accepted the fact that we're gonna run integer programs. The integer program algorithm is a black box. And yes, itself, it produces a certificate of optimality. That's your search tree. It, it proves optimality as it goes, but the proof is not human understandable. So uh, that's a fight we had to have and, and the clinicians accepted it. Uh, how, how we actually made them a little more comfortable with that is that we had CPLEX as a shadow solver in the early days when the exchange was still small and you could just run a standard integer program on it. And then we showed that the solutions were equally good from both solvers. And that's how they built trust on our solver. And, uh, and then we moved to the large and only only we're using our only are using our solver. All right, and and we'll finish on one last philosophical issue, which was regarding explanations. Um, can you see that, Thomas? Uh, this one that says, "I agree with your." Yeah, that one. Yeah, I the question by Charlie is, "I agree with your insights on explainability." You raised the important question: what is what is an explanation anyway? But what is an explanation for you? Ah, that is, I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. So uh, I, I've been thinking about it a little bit, uh, um, not, 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 not too much, but uh, it, it, it really depends. Like how would somebody explain to me that this is the best policy? That's a very hard thing to explain to me. Uh, if they claim that well, here's a complicated policy and it's, it's best in some sense. That's very, very tough to explain. And I don't know how. I, I, I would personally, I believe in, in, in algorithms and, 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 you know, integer programming, you know, whatever, policy optimization. So as long as, you know, I can somehow trust that the algorithm is good by maybe reading the paper and so on, I'll just, I'll, I'll end up trusting it. But so I, I don't really require any sort of extraneous explanation. All right. Um, 
we're a bit over time, but uh, people have uh, stuck around. It was a very fascinating lecture. Uh, just like to thank you for your time. And uh, thanks everybody for sticking around for your time. Thank you very much uh, and, and, and great questions. Um, and if you have any more questions, happy to communicate by email. Thank you. So this concludes the session. We'll uh, end recording and close this program. Thank you. Thank you.